Hello everybody. Today I am driving for the first time a Ford Puma. But this is no ordinary Puma. This is the Ford Racing Puma. The regular car I think already has a very good claim to being a genuine cult vehicle. But the Racing Puma is an altogether different level of special. Released to celebrate the racing that the Puma never actually did, this very limited edition car faced some troubles when it was released in the showrooms about 20 years ago because you see Ford wanted about the same money for one of these as Subaru were asking for an Impreza. And the Impreza at the time had more power, more wheel drive and some actual real race pedigree to back up the asking price. So as you can imagine, Ford didn't have a very easy time finding homes for the planned run of a thousand cars that they were going to make. In fact, only 500 were ever produced because the half that were meant to go to Germany just never materialised, leaving 500 cars needing to be homed. So few people were willing to stump up their own cash for one of these that allegedly very many got stuffed into the pockets of Ford executives as they left the factory gates. However, two decades on and people are asking fairly serious money for one of these cars. So it's about time that I ask the question, could it possibly be worth it? After all, you could easily pay nearly this car's original asking price for one now. The regular Puma was a very nice, small, compact, sporty front engine, front wheel drive car. It was a very popular format when they were in production. It had a lifespan of about five years from around 97 to 2002. It came with a choice of engines and essentially it is a Fiesta with some nice styling. It's part of the new edge group of cars like the KA and all that sort of stuff that Ford were bringing out at the time. You've got these seats which are fabulous. You've also got a peppier version of the 1.7 litre ZTEC engine, producing here about 30 horses more than in regular car trim, so about 150 odd horsepower in total. You've also got bespoke brakes, which were developed from racing items. You have tuned suspension and the thing most people recognize, a much wider body. Those front arches in particular look absolutely gargantuan in comparison to the regular car. Once upon a time, a Puma, a normal one, was quite a common sight. My neighbour actually had one for a little bit, although unfortunately I never got a chance to drive it. They had a reputation for being an extremely fun and affordable car. You could pick one up for only a few hundred pounds, and for that very reason, people got them, they enjoyed them, and then as soon as they cost anything to fix, they usually binned them. As is common with many cars of the era, these did suffer quite badly from rust. And because they weren't the sort of car that often lived in a nice heated garage through the winter, a good few doses of salt, and they were gone. At low speeds, here are my first impressions. The gearbox has a very short throw, it's very direct and is actually really quite nice to use. It has only the five speeds in it, but again, for this era of car, that's not uncommon. It's also very bouncy, very, very bouncy indeed. It's not crashy, but it is quite firm, and to justify this suspension setup, it is going to have to be something very special when I get to my favorite back road, which is only a minute or two down that way, don't you worry. Steering, actually really quite nice, and this car does generally feel very tight. I'm not entirely sure whether that exhaust is standard, because it's making some noises that I wouldn't expect from a standard exhaust. And in fact, using the power of editing, I will be able to tell you whether it is a standard item. Yes, it is, actually. The interior does feel typical 1990s Ford, that is to say, pretty cheap. And this is one of two cars brought down to me today by a son and father pairing. So I have to say a big thank you to Alex and his dad, John, for bringing these out. 
His dad's car is not a Ford, and you do often get Ford families. It's something considerably wilder. I hope you enjoyed that review, which may come out next. There is quite a bit of space in this car, not so much for people in the back, but the boot's pretty generous when you consider the overall size of car. And I think most people are going to use this essentially as a two-seater or maybe three-seater with the occasional big boot space. It's a very decent format, and for a long time it was pretty popular to have cars like this. Yet little coupe versions of fairly ordinary hatchbacks, it was the done thing a long time ago. In the flesh, I think it's actually a, a pretty damn good looking car, actually, it must be said. It's quite purposeful, really diminutive, a very cute looking thing. The AC doesn't work brilliantly, but it is swelteringly hot today, so I can't hold that against it too much. And you don't buy a car like this for icy cold air conditioning. You buy it solely for the smile it can put on your face. So, let's not muck about anymore. Let's have a go, shall we, and see just how good it is. Sensational! This is one of the most fun, engaging front-wheel drive cars I've ever had the pleasure to steer. And I have, by the way, just done a month filming about 10 incredible hot hatch legends, so my mind is fresh with the impressions from some of the all-time greats. This car thoroughly deserves to be up there. Now, outright pace is not where the Puma scores highly. It's no slouch at all, and once that engine starts to sing, you really do move. It's about 1160 kilos, this car. It's actually heavier than the standard one, I believe. But that's not a problem. It's light, it's agile, and the steering is, I think, the best in any Ford I've ever driven. Really remarkable. The brakes are pretty good too. Now, what you need to be aware of is the back end because it's very clear that this car has a pretty serious front weight bias. And that means when you do start to get over interesting and exciting roads like the ones that I used to test these cars, the back end starts to play quite a bit, so you have to keep an eye on it. The front can also wash wide a little bit as well, but it's fine. It's all completely fine because it's telling you at every single moment exactly what is going on. You know everything about what this car and chassis are doing. Because it is so small, the fact that it does move around on the road isn't a problem. You can keep it under control quite nicely and you can really enjoy everything that it has to offer. This exhaust isn't to my liking, it sounds a little bit too buzzy and harsh and it, it pops and bangs more than I really would like it to. But as a package, it's fantastic. Now what is different from the normal Puma but is correct for the racing Puma is the intake manifold. They are all individually numbered too. Throttle response is utterly sensational and actually the car that this is reminding me of in many ways is the Vauxhall Astra GTE. If for its engine and, and nothing else because this handles way better than the GTE ever did. The steering wheel wriggles around in your hand like an old 911's. Yeah, it, it sort of there's a there's just a slight moment of hesitation on the turn in, then the car pulls into the corner really happily. But then you've got to watch out for that tail, because the, the tail is not the most planted. Heel and toe, dead easy and a lot of fun. <laughs> Oh, you can be a hooligan in this car. Now, what's the turning circle like? Bad. It's bad. Not the worst I've encountered, but it's not brilliant.
It will spin quite happily all the way to 7,000 and it feels like it's making power the whole time. The faster you go, the better that suspension gets. Although it's never comfortable, it never seems to flow like some other cars that I've driven with this kind of setup. It also follows the camber in the road in quite a dramatic fashion. I feel like what I'm doing with this steering wheel is more guidelines for the car rather than actual rules for it to follow. Gearbox is brilliant. Seats fabulous too. They are, they are something. But Ford, Ford always gets seats right. That's just a thing. They just seem to have this ability to get seats right. And in all fairness, in some of their modern cars, steering's been brilliant too. But I haven't driven many Fords of this era, so I wasn't quite sure what to expect with regards to that. But I have to say, that's sensational. In truth, I was fully prepared for the racing Puma to be something of a disappointment. I really was. But in actual fact, it, it, it simply isn't. This is an extraordinarily engaging car. This is one of the most fun cars I've ever driven. No, not the most competent. No, not the most sexy, not the fastest, not anything like that. If you want a car that will challenge you but also reward and at sensible speeds, it's ace. Under braking, the car will also try and follow the road, so you've got to be ready at all times for it to do whatever it wants. A bit like an Alfa Romeo 4C in many ways. The pedals are reasonably close together as well, which is part of the reason heel and toe is so easy and so fun. Not really very torquey, but are you surprised for a 1.7 litre naturally aspirated engine? It's all about those revs. And it's so much fun. Dip it down, turn. Now, some of these were fitted with a limited slip diff, but I don't think this is one of them. So you've got to watch out for it. And you've got to give it a bit more room than you think maybe you should, because it will go sightseeing. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I sounded like Predator dying there, didn't I? In all honesty, Ford Racing Puma, yes. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye-bye.